Chapter thirty six of Trail of the Hawk. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Vendetti. MikeVendetti dot com. Trail of the Hawk by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter thirty six. There were, as Ruth had remarked, families. When Carl was formally invited to dine at the Winslows on a night late in April, his only anxiety was as to the condition of his dinner coat. He arrived in a state of easy briskness planning apt and sensible remarks about the business situation for Mason and Mr. Winslow. As the maid opened the door, Carl was wondering if he would be able to touch Ruth's hand under the table. He had an anticipatory fondness for all of the small, friendly family group, which was about to receive him, and he was cast into a den of strangers, most of them comprised in the one eclectic person of Aunt Emma Trugate Winslow. Aunt Emma Trugate Winslow was the general commanding in whatsoever group she was placed in by Providence, with which she had a strong influence. At a White House reception she would pleasantly but firmly have sent the President about his business, and have taken his place in the receiving line. Just now she sat in a prehistoric S-chair, near the center of the drawing-room, pumping out of Phil Donnelly most of the facts about his chief's private lives. Aunt Emma had the soul of a six-foot dowager duchess, and should have had an eagle nose and a white pompadour. Actually, she was of medium height, with a not unduly maternal bosom, a broad commonplace face, hair the color of faded grass, a blunt nose with slightly enlarged pores, and thin lips that seemed to be a straight line when seen from in front, but seen in profile, puffed out like a fish's. She had a habit of nodding intelligently even when she was not listening, and another habit of rubbing her left knuckles with the fingers of her right hand. Not imposing in appearance was Aunt Emma Trugate Winslow, but she was born to discipline a court. An impeccable widow was she, speaking with a broad A, and dressed exquisitely in a black satin evening gown. By such simple-hearted traits as being always right about unimportant matters and idealistic wrong about important matters, politely intruding into everything, being earnest about the morality of the poor and auction bridge and the chaperoning of nice girls, possessing a working knowledge of Wagner and Roden, wearing fifteen-dollar corsets, and believing on her bended knees that the Trugates and Winslows were the noblest families in the social register. Aunt Emma Trugate Winslow, had persuaded the whole world, including even her near-English butler, that she was a superior woman. Family tradition said that she had only to raise a finger to get into really smart society. Upon the death of Ruth's mother, Aunt Emma had taken it as one of her duties, along with sympathy concerts and committees, to rear Ruth properly. She had been neglecting this duty so far to permit the invasion of a barbarian named Erickson only because she had been in California with her young son, Arthur. Just now, while her house was being opened, she was staying at the Winslows, with Arthur and a peculiarly beasty Japanese spaniel named Takasan. She was introduced at Carl. She glanced him over and passed him on to Olive Donnelly. All in forty-five seconds, when Carl had recovered from a sensation of being a kitten drowned in a sack, he said agreeable things to Olive, and observed the situation in the drawing-room. Phil was marked out for Aunt Emma's favors. Mr. Winslow sat in a corner, apparently crushed with restorative conversation administered by Ruth. Mason Winslow was haughtingly attentive to a plain, well-dressed, amiable girl named Florence Cruden, who had prematurely gray hair, the weekend habit, and a weakness for baby talk. Ruth's medical student brother, Bobby Winslow, was not there. The more he saw of Bobby's kind Aunt Emma, the more Carl could find it in his heart to excuse Bobby for having escaped the family dinner. Carl had an uncomfortable moment when Aunt Emma and Mr. Winslow asked him questions about the development of the Turricar, but before he could determine whether he was being deliberately inspected by the family, the ordeal was over. As they went into dinner, Mr. Winslow, taking in Aunt Emma like a small boy, accompanying the school principal, Ruth had the chance to whisper, "'My hawk, 
be good. Please believe I'm not responsible. It's all Aunt Emma's doing, this dreadfully stately family dinner. Don't let her bully you. I'm frightened to death, and— Yes, Phil, I'm coming. The warning did not seem justified in view of the attractive table. Candles, cut glass, a mound of flowers on a beveled mirror, silvery linen, and grapefruit with champagne. Carl was on one side of Aunt Emma, but she seemed more interested in Mr. Winslow at the end of the table, and on the other side Carl had a safe companion in Olive Dunlavy. Across from him was Florence Crowden, Phil, and Ruth, Ruth shimmering in a gown of yellow satin which broke the curve of her fine flushed shoulder only by a narrow band. The conversation played with people. Florence Crowden told to applause and laughter of an exploratory visit to the College of the City of New York, and her discovery of a strange race, young Jews mostly who went to college to study, and had no sense of the nobility of making fraternities. Such outsiders, she said. Can't you imagine the sort of a party they'd have? They'd all stand around and discuss psychology and dissecting puppies and Greek roots. Phil, I think it would be a lovely punishment for you to have to join them to work in a laboratory all day and wear a celluloid collar. Uh, I know their sort. Greasy grinds, we used to call them. There were plenty of them in Yale, condescended Phil. Maybe they do wear celluloid collars. If they do, it's because they're poor, protested Ruth. My dear child, sniffed Aunt Emma, with collars only twenty-five cents apiece? Don't be silly. Mr. Winslow declared with portly timidity, Why, Em, my collars don't cost me but fifteen. Mason, dear, let's not discuss it at dinner. Tell me, all of you, the scandal I've missed by going to California, which reminds me. Did I tell you I saw that miserable Amy Baslin, you remember, that married the porter or the superintendent or something in her father's factory? I saw her and her husband at Pasadena. And they seemed to be happy. Of course, Amy would put the best face she could on it. But they must have been miserably unhappy. Such a sad affair. And she could have married quite decently. What do you mean by decently? demanded Ruth. Carl was startled. He had once asked Ruth the same question about the same phrase. Aunt Emma revolved like a gun turret, getting Ruth's range and remarked calmly, my dear child, you know quite well what I mean. Don't, I beg you, bring any socialistic problems to dinner till you have really learned something about them. Now, I want to hear all the nice scandals I have missed. There were not many she had missed, but she kept the conversation sternly to discussions of people whose names Carl had never heard. Again, he was obviously an outsider. Still ignoring Carl, Aunt Emma demanded of Ruth and Phil, sitting together opposite her. "'Tell me about the good times you children have been having, Ruthie, and I'm so glad that Phil and you finally went to the William Turingers, and your letter about the Beaux Arts Festival was charming, Ruthie. I quite envied you and Phil.' The dragon continued talking to Ruth while Carl listened in the intricacies of his chatter to Olive. I hope you haven't been giving all your time and beauty sleep doing too much of that settlement work, Ruthie, and heaven only knows what germs you will get there. Of course, I should be first to praise any work for the poor, ungrateful, and shiftless though they are. What with my committees in the Trugate Temperance Home for Young Working Girls, it's all very well to be sympathetic with them, but— when it comes to a settlement house, and heaven knows, I have given them all the counsel and suggestions I could, though some of the professional settlement workers are as pert as they can be, and I really do believe some of them think they are trying to end poverty entirely, just as though the Lord would have sent poverty into the world if he didn't have a pretty good reason for it. You will remember the Bible says— the poor you always have with you, and, as Florence Barclay says in her novels, which may seem a little sentimental, but they are of such good moral effect. You can't supersede the scriptures even in the most charming social circles. 
to say nothing of the blessings of poverty. I'm sure they're much happier than we are with our onerous duties. I'm sure that any of these ragamuffin, anarchists and socialists and anti-militanists want to take over my committees. They are welcome if they'll take over the miserable headaches and worried hours they give me, trying to do something for the poor. They won't even be clean, but even in model tenements they will put coal in bathtubs. And so I do hope you haven't just been wearing yourself to the bone, working for ungrateful, dirty little children, Ruthie. No, Auntie dear, I've been quite as discreet as any Winslow should be. You see, I'm selfish, too, aren't I, Carl? Oh, very. Aunt Emma seemed to remember then that some sort of a man whose species she didn't quite know sat next to her. She glanced at Carl again, gave him up as an error in social judgment, and went on. No, Ruthie, not selfish so much as thoughtless about the duties of a family like ours. And I was always the first to say that with the Winslows are as fine a stock as the true gates. And I am going to see that you go out more the rest of this year, Ruthie. I want you and Phil to plan right now to attend the charity league dances next season. You must learn to concentrate your attention. Auntie dear, please leave my wickedness till the next time we— My dear child, now that I have the chance to get all of us together, I'm sure Mr. Erickson will pardon the rest of us our little family discussion. I want to take you and Master Phil to task together. You are both of you negligent of social duties. Duties they are, Ruthie, for man was not born to serve alone though Phil is far better than you, with your queer habits, and heaven only knows where you got them, neither your father nor your dear sainted mother was slack or selfish. Dear auntie, let's admit that I'm a black sheep with a little black bustle, and a habit of butting all sorts of ash cans, and let Phil go on his social way rejoicing. Ruth was jaunty, but her face was strained, and she bit her lip with staccato nervousness. When she was not speaking, Carl ventured to face the dragon. Miss Winslow, I'm sure Ruth has been better than you think. She has been learning all these fiendishly complicated new dances. You know, a poor businessman like myself finds them. Yes, said Aunt Emma. I am sure she will always remember that she is a Winslow and must carry on the family traditions, but sometimes I am afraid she gets under bad influences because of her good nature. She said it loudly. She looked Carl in the eye. The whole table stopped talking. Carl felt like a tramp who has kicked a chained bulldog and discovers that the chain is broken. He wanted to be good, not make a scene. He noticed with intent indignation that Phil was grinning. He planned to get Phil off in a corner, not necessarily a dark corner, and beat him. He wanted to telegraph Ruth, dared not. He realized in a quarter of a second that he must have been discussed by the family, and did not like it. Everyone seemed to be waiting for him to speak. Awkwardly he said, wondering all the while if she meant what her tone said she meant, by bad influences. Yes, but just going to say, I believe settlement work is a good influence. Please don't discuss, Ruth was groaning when Aunt Emma sternly interrupted. It is good of you to take up the cudgels, Mr. Erickson, and please don't misjudge me. Of course I realize that I am only a silly old woman, and that my passion to see the Winslows keep to their fine standards is old-fashioned. But you see, it is a hobby of mine that I have devoted years to, and you who haven't known the Winslows so very long. Her manner was almost courteous. Yes, that's so, Carl mumbled agreeably, just as she dropped the courtesy and went on. You can't judge, in fact. This is nothing personal, you know. I don't suppose it's possible for Westerners to have any idea how precious family ideals are to Easterners. Of course, we're probably silly about them, and it's splendid, your wheat lands, and not caring who your grandfather was, but to make up for those things, we 
do have to protect what we have gained through the generations. Carl longed to stand up, to defy them all, to cry, If you mean that you think Ruth has to be protected against me, have the decency to say so. Yet he kept his voice gentle. But why be narrowed to just a few families in one's interests? Now this settlement... One isn't narrowed. There are plenty of good families for Ruth to consider, when it comes time for my little girl to consider alliances at all, Aunt Emma coldly stated. I will shut up, he told himself. I will shut up. I'll see this dinner through and then never come near this house again. He tried to look casual, as though the conversation was safely finished, but Aunt Emma was waiting for him to go on. In the general stillness her corsets creaked with belligerent attention. He played with his fork in a, well, if that's how you feel about it, perhaps it would be better not to discuss it any further. My dear madam, manner growing every second more flushed, embarrassed, sick, angry, trying harder every second to look unconcerned. Aunt Emma hawked a delicate and ladylike hawk in her patrician throat, perfectory to a new attack. Carl knew he would be tempted to retort brutally. Then from the door of the dining-room whippered the high voice of an excited child. "'Oh, Mama! Oh, Cousin Ruthie! Nurse says Hawk Erickson is here! I want to see him!' Everyone turned toward a boy of five or six, round as a baby chicken, in his fuzzy miniature pajamas, protectingly holding a cotton monkey under his arm, sturdy and shy and defiant. "'Why, Arthur! Why, my son! Oh, the darling baby from the table! Come here, Arthur, and let's hear your troubles before Nurse nabs you, old son," said Phil, not at all condescendingly, rising from the table, holding out his arms. "No, oh, no, just, just let me go. I want to see Hawk Erickson. Is that Hawk Erickson?" demanded the son of Aunt Emma, pointing at Carl. "Yes, sweetheart," said Ruth softly, proudly, running madly about the end of the table. Arthur jumped at Carl's lap. Carl swung him up and inquired, "'What is it, old man? Are you Hawk Erickson?' "'At your command, Captain.' Aunt Emma rose and said masterfully, "'Come, little son, now you've seen Mr. Erickson. It's up to Betty again, up to Betty.' "'No, no, please don't, Mama. I've never seen an aviator before, not all my life. And you promised me, cross your heart, at Pasadena you did, I could see one.' Arthur's face showed signs of imminent badness. "'Well, you may stay for a while, then,' said Aunt Emma, weakly unconscious that her sway had departed from her, while the rest of the table grinned except Carl, who was absorbed in Arthur's ecstasy. "'I'm going to be an aviator, too. I think an aviator is braver than anybody. I'd rather be an aviator than a general or a policeman or anybody. I got a picture of you on my scrapbook.' You got a funny hat like Cousin Bobby wears when he plays football in it. Should I get the picture in my scrapbook? Honest. Will you give me another? Aunt Emma made one more attempt to coax Arthur up to bed, but His Majesty refused, and she compromised by scolding his nurse and sending up for his dressing gown a small blue dressing gown on which yellow ducks and white bunny rabbits paraded proudly. Like our blue bowl, Carl commented to Ruth. Not till after coffee in the drawing-room would Arthur consent to go to bed. This real head of the Emma Wilson family was far too much absorbed in making Carl tell of his long races and why does a flying machine fly? What's a wind pressure? Why does wind shove up? Why is the wings curved? Why does it want to catch the wind? The others listened, including Aunt Emma. Carl went home early. Ruth had the opportunity to confide. Hawk, dear, I can't tell you how ashamed I am of my family for enduring anybody so rude and opinionated as Aunt Emma. But it's all right now, isn't it? No, no, don't kiss me, but dear dreams, Hawk. Phil's voice from behind shouted, Oh, Erickson, just a second. Carl was not at all pleased. He remembered that Phil had listened with obvious amusement to his agonized attempt to turn Aunt Emma's attacks, said Phil, while Ruth disappeared. Which way are you going? Walk to the subway with you. You win, old man. I admire your nerve for facing Aunt Emma. What I wanted to say, 
I hope to thunder you don't think I was in any way responsible for Mrs. Winslow's linking me and Ruth the way they did. Oh, you understand, I admire you, like the devil, for knowing what you want and going after it. I suppose you'll have to convince Ruth yet, but, by Jove, you've convinced me. Glad you had Arthur for an ally. They don't make Kitty seem better. God, if I could have a son like that. I turn off here. Good luck, Erickson. Thanks a lot, Phil. Thanks. Good night, Carl. End of chapter 36「Chapter thirty seven of Trail of the Hawk. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Vendetti, MikeVendetti dot com. Trail of the Hawk by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter thirty seven. Long Beach on the first hot Sunday of May, when motorists come out from New York, half ready to open asphalt hearts to sea and sky, Carl's first sight of it, save from an aeroplane, and he was mad happy to find real shore so near the city. Ruth and he were picnicking, vulgar and unashamed, among the dunes at the end of the long boardwalk, like the beer-drinking, pickle-eating parties of fishermen and the family groups with red tablecloths, grape basket lunches, and colored Sunday supplements. Ruth declared that she preferred them to the elegant loungers who were showing off new motor coats on the boardwalk. But Carl and she had withdrawn a bit from the crowds, and in the dunes had made a nest with a book and a magazine and a box of chocolates and Carl's collapsible lunch kit. Not New York only, but all of Ruth's relatives were forgot. Aunt Emma True Great Winslow was a myth of the dragon-haunted past. Here all was fresh, color and free, spaces looking to open sea. Behind the dunes, with her tragedies of pale grass, revealed the sharp, undershadowed green of marshes and an inland bay that was blue as bluing a startling blue, bordered by the emerald marshes. To one side, afar, not troubling their peace, were the crimson roofs of fantastic houses, like chalets and California missions and villas of the Riviera, with gables and turrets of red tiles. Before their feet was the cream-colored beach, marked by ridges of driftwood, mixed with small glistening shells, long ranks of pale yellow seaweed, and the delicate wrinkles in the sand that were the tracks of receding waves. The breakers left the beach wet and shining for a moment, like plates of raw-colored copper, making one cry out with its flashing beauty. Then, at last, the eyes lifted to unbroken blue water, nothing between them and Europe save rolling waves and wave crests like white plumes. The sea was of a diaphanous blue that shaded through a bold steel blue, and a lucent blue, enameled to a rich ultramarine, which absorbed and healed the office-worn mind. The sails of tacking sloops were a blossom, seagulls swooped, a tall surf fisherman in a red flannel shirt and shiny black hip boots strode out into the water and cast with a long curve of his line cumulus clouds whose pure white was shaded with a delicious golden tone were baronial above and out on the skyline steamers raced by round them was the warm intimacy of the dune sands beyond was infinite space calling to them to be big and unafraid talking falling into silence touched with the mystery of sun and sea they confessed youth's excited wonder about the world carl sitting cross-legged rubbing his ankles a springy figure in blue flannel and a daring tie, while Ruth, in deep rose linen, her throat bright and bare, lay with her chin in her hands, a flush beneath the gentle brown of her cheeks, her white-clad ankles crossed under her skirt, slender against the gray sand, thoughtful of eye, lost in happiness. Some day, Carl was musing, your children and mine will say, you certainly lived in the most marvelous age in the world. Think of it. They talk about the romance of the Crusades and the Romans and all that, but think of the miracles we've seen already. And we're only kids. Aviation and the automobile and wireless and moving pictures and electric locomotives and electric cooking and the use of radium and the X-ray and the linotype and the submarine and labor movement, the IWW, the syndication and all that. Not that I know anything about the labor movement. 
but I suppose it's the most important of all. And Metlikoff and Ehrlich, oh yes, and a good share of the development of the electric light and telephone and the phonograph. Golly, in just a few years. Yes, Ruth added, the Montessori system of education, that's what I think is the most important. See that sailboat, Hawk? Like a lily, and the late afternoon gold on those marshes. I think this salt breeze blows away all the bad Ruth. Oh, don't forget the attempts to cure cancer and consumption. So many big things starting right now, while we're sitting here. Lord, what an age! Romance? Why, there's more romance in a wireless spark. Think of it. Little lonely wallowing steamer at night out in the dark, slamming out a radio like forty thousand tigers spitting, and a man getting it here on Long Island. More romance than in all the galleons that ever sailed the purple tropics, which they mostly ain't purple, but dirty green. Anything's possible now. World cools off? All right. We'll move on some other planet. It gets me going. Don't have to believe in fairies to give the imagination a job today. Glad I've been an aviator. Gives me some place in it all anyway. I'm glad too, Hawk. Terribly glad. The sun was crimsoning, the wind grew chilly. The beach was scattered with campfires. Their own little fires settled into compact live coals, which in the dark of the dune hollow spread over a million bits of quartz, a glow through which frequented the antique sea fleas. Carl's cigarette had the fragrance that comes only from being impregnated with the smoke of an outdoor fire. The waves were lyric and a group at the next fire crooned old Black Joe. The two lovers curled in their nest, hand moved towards hand. Ruth whispered, It's sweet to be with all these people and fires. Will I really learn not to be supercilious? Honey, you supercilious? Democracy? Oh, the dickens. Let's not talk about theories any more, but just about us. Her hand, tight-coiled as a snail-shell was closed in his. "'Your hand is asleep in my hand's arms,' he whispered. The ball of his thumb pressed her thumb, and he whispered once more, "'See? Now our hands are kissing each other. We—we we must watch them better. Your thumb is like a fairy.' Again his thumb hardened with file and wrench and steering wheel touched hers. It was startling like a kiss of real lips. Lightly she returned the finger kiss, answering diffidently. Our hands are mad, silly hands, to think that Long Beach is a tropical jungle. You aren't angry at them? N no. He cradled her head on his shoulder. His hand gripped her arm till she cried, You hurt me. He kissed her cheek. She drew back as far as she could. Her hand against his chest held him away for a minute. Her defense suddenly collapsed, and she was relaxed and throbbing in his arms. He slipped his fingers under her chin and turned up her face till he could kiss her lips. He had not known the lips of man and woman could be so long, so stirring. Yet at first he was disappointed. This was, after all, but a touch, just a touch as finger against finger. But her lips grew more intense against his, returning and taking the kiss, both of them giving and receiving at once. Wondering at himself for it, Carl thought of other things. He was amazed that, while their lips were hot together, he worried as to what train Ruth ought to take after dinner. Yet with such thoughts conferring, he was in an ecstasy beyond sorrow, praying that to her, as to him, there was no pain but instead a rapture in the sting of her lips, as her teeth cut a little into them, a kiss thing that the polite novels sketch as a second's unbodied bliss. How human it was, with teeth and lips to consider common as eating, and divine as martyrdom. His lips were saying to her lips too vast and extravagant for a plain young man to venture upon in words. Lady, to you I chant my reverence and faith everlasting in such unearthly music as the angels use when with lambent wings they salute the marching dawn. Such lyric tributes, and an emotion too subtle to fit into any words whatever, his lips were saying. Then she was drawing back, rending the kiss, and crying, 
You're almost smothering me. With his arms easily about her, but with her weight against his shoulder, they and their love veiled from the basket parties by the darkness, he said quiveringly, See, my arms are a little house for you, just as my hand was a little house for your hand once. My arms are the walls, and your head and mine together are the roof. I love the little house. No, say I love you. No, say it. No, please. Oh, Hawk, dear, I couldn't even if— Just now, I do want to say it, but I want to be fair. I am terribly happy to be in the house of Hawk's arms. I am not afraid of it, even out here in the dark dunes, which Aunt Emma wouldn't somehow approve. But I do want to be fair to you, and I'm afraid I'm not when I let you love me this way. I don't want to hurt you, ever. Perhaps it's egotistical for me, but I'm afraid you would be hurt if I let you kiss me, and then afterward I decided I didn't love you at all. But can't you some day? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure I know what love is. I'm not sure it's love that makes me happy, as I really am when you kiss me. Perhaps I'm just curious and experimenting. I was quite conscious when you kissed me then, quite conscious and curious, and once I caught myself wondering for a half second what train we'd take. I was ashamed of that. But I wasn't ashamed of taking mental notes and learning what these kisses that we mentioned so glibly really are, just experimenting, you see. And if you are too serious about our kiss, it wouldn't be at all fair to you. I'm glad you're frank, blessed, and I guess I understand pretty well how you feel, but, after all, I'm fairly simple about such things. Blessed, blessed, I don't really know a thing, but I love you. His arms were savage again. He kissed her, kissed her lips, kissed the hollow of her throat. Then he lifted her from the ground and would not set her down till she had kissed him back. You frightened me a lot then, she said. Did the child want to impress Ruth with his mighty strength? Well, she shall be impressed, Hawk, I do hope. I do hate myself for not knowing my mind. I will try not to experiment. I want you to be happy. I do want to be honest with you. If I am honest with you, will you try not to be too impatient till I do know just what I want? Oh, I'm sick of the modern lover. I talk and talk about love. It seems as though we lost the power to be simple, like the old ballads. Or weren't the ballad people really simple either? You say you are, so I think you will have to run away with me. But not till after dinner. Come. The moon was rising, swinging hands, they trumped towards the boardwalk. The crunch of their feet in the sand was the rhythmic spell of a magician, which she broke when she sighed. Should I have let you kiss me out there in the wilds? Will you respect me after it? Princess, you're all the respect there is in the world. It seems so strange. We were absorbed in war and electricity, and then— Love is war and electricity, or else it's dull. And I don't think we two will ever get dull. If you do decide, you can love me. We'll wander, cabin in the Rockies, with forty mountains for our garden's fence, and an eagle for our suburban train. And South Sea Island silhouetted at sunset. Look, that moon! I always imagine it so clearly when I hear Hawaiian singers on the Victrola, and a Hawaiian beach with fireflies in the jungle behind the phosphorescent sea in front of and native girls dancing in garlands. Yes, in Paris boulevards, a mysterious castle in the Austrian mountains, with a hidden treasure in dark, secret dungeons, and heavy iron armor, and then bing! A brand new prairie town in Saskatchewan or Dakota, with brand new sunlight on the fresh pine shacks, and beyond the town the plains with brand new grass rolling. But seriously, Hawk, would you want to go to all those places if you were married? Would you practically? You know, even rich globetrotters go to the same sorts of places, mostly, and we wouldn't even be rich, would we? No, just comfortable, maybe five thousand a year. Well, would you really want to keep on going and take your wife? Or would you settle down like the rest and spend money so you could keep in shape to make money to spend to keep in shape? 
Seriously, I would keep going if I had the right girl to go with me. It would be mighty important which one, though, I guess. And by that I mean you. Once when I quit flying, I thought that maybe I'd stop wandering and settle down, maybe even marry a geranium kind of a girl, but I was meant to hike for the hiking's sake. Only not alone any more. I need you. We'd go and go, no limit. And we wouldn't just go places either. We'd be different things. We'd be Connecticut farmers one year, and run a mine in Mexico the next, and loaf in Paris the next. We had the money. Sometimes you almost tempt me to like you. Like me now? No, not now, but... Here's the boardwalk. Where's those steps? Oh, yes, gee. I hate to leave the water without having a had a swim. Wish we'd had one. Dare you to go waiting? Oh, ought I to? Do you think waiting would be silly and nice? Of course you ought. Come on. Don't you remember how the sand feels between your toes? The moon brooded upon the lulled waves and questered among the ridges of driftwood for pearly shells. The pools left by the waves were enticing. Ruth retreated into the shelter of the boardwalk and came shyly out, clutching her skirts, her feet and ankles silver in the night. The sand does feel good, but it's getting colder and colder. She wailed as she cautiously advanced into the water. I'll think up punishments for you. You're not only caused me to be cold, but you've made me abominably self-conscious. Don't be self-conscious, Bless. We are just children exploring. He splashed out, coat off, trousers rolled up to knees above his thin, muscular legs, galloping along the edge of the water like a large puppy, while she danced after him. They were still to the persuasive beauty of the night. Music from the topaz jeweled hotels far down the beach wove itself into the peace on land and sea. A fish lying on shore was turned by the moon into ivory with carven scales before them reaching to the ancient towers of england and france and the islands of the sea was the whispering water a tenderness that understood everything made allowance for everything in her and in himself folded its wings around him as he scanned her and stood like a slender statue of silver dark hair moon brightened white arms holding her skirts white legs round which the spent waves sparkled with unworldly fire he waded over to her and timidly kissed the edge of her hair. She rubbed her cheek against his. Now we must run, she said. She quickly turned back to the shadow of the boardwalk to draw on her stockings and shoes, leaning on the sand like the supple maid of the ballads which she had been envying. They tramped along the boardwalk, with heels clicking like castanets, conscious that the world was hushed in a night's old enchantment. As they had answered to companionship with the humble picnic parties among the dunes, so now they found it amusing to dine among the semi-great and semi-motorists at the Nassau. Ruth had a distinct pleasure when T. Wentler, horse fancier, aviation enthusiast, president of the First State Bank of Sacramento, came up, reminded Carl of their acquaintanceship at the Oakland Berkeley Aero Meet, and begged Ruth and Carl to join him, his wife and Senator Leifert, for coffee. As they waited for their train, quiet with laughter, Ruth remarked, "'It was jolly to play with the personages. You haven't seen much of the frivolous side of me. It's pretty important. You don't know how much soul satisfaction I get out of dancing all night and playing tennis with flannel loafs and eating morois glaciers and chatting in a box at the opera till I spoil the entire evening for all the German music lovers.' and talking to all the nice doggies from the tennis and racquet club whenever I get invited to Piping Rock or Meadowbrook or any other country club that has ancestors. I want you to take a warning. Did you really miss Piping Rock much today? No, but I might tomorrow, and I might get horribly bored in our cabin in the Rockies and hate the stony old peaks and long for tea and scandal in the corner at the Ritz. Then we'd hike on to San Francisco, have tea at the St. Francis or the Fairmont or the Palace, then beat it for your Hawaii and fireflies in the bush. 
Perhaps, but suppose, just suppose, we were married, and suppose the tour car didn't go so awfully well, and we had to be poor, and couldn't go running away, but had to stick in one beastly city flat and economize. It's all very well to talk of working things out together, but think of not being able to have decent clothes and going to the movies every night. Ugh. When I see some of the girls who used to be so pretty and gay, and they went and married poor men, now they are so worn and tired, bedraggled, and perambulatorless, and they worry about biddies and furnace and cabbages, and their hair is just scratched together with the dubbest hats. I'd rather be an idle rich. If we get stuck like that, I'd sell out and we'd hike to the mountain cabin anyway. Say, go up in the Santa Lucias and keep wild bees, and probably get stung in the maybe subtle senses of the word. And I'd have to cook and wash. That would be fun as fun. But to have to do it? Ruth, honey, let's not worry about it now anyway. I don't believe there's much danger, and don't let's spoil this bully day. It's been sweet. I won't croak any more. There's the train coming. End of chapter 37Chapter thirty eight of Trail of the Hawk. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Vendetti, MikeVendetti dot com. Trail of the Hawk by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter thirty eight. While the New York June grew hotter and hotter and stickier and stickier, while the crowds crammed together in the subway in a jam as unlovely as a pile of tomato cans in a public dump heap, grew pale in the damp heat, Carl labored in his office and almost every evening called on Ruth, who was waiting for the first of July, when she was to go to Cousin Pat and Kerr's in the Berkshires. Carl tried to bring her coolness. He ate only poached eggs on toast or soup and salad for dinner, that he might not be torpid. He gave her moss roses with drops of water like dew on the stems. They set out on the box stoop and unfriendly New York Street, adopting, for a time, the frank neighborliness of a village, and exclaimed over every breeze. They talked about the charm of forty degrees below zero, that is, sometimes. Their favorite topic was themselves. She still insisted that she was not in love with him. Hooted at the idea of being engaged, she might some day go off and get married to someone, but engaged? Never. She finally agreed that they were engaged to be engaged to be engaged. One night, when they sought the windy housetop, she twisted his arms about her and almost went to sleep, with her hair smooth beneath his chin. He sat motionless till his arms ached with the strain, till her shoulders seemed to stick into his like a bar of iron. Glad that she trusted him enough to doze into a warm slumber in the familiarity of his arms. Yet he dared not kiss her throat as he had done at Long Beach. As lovers do, Carl had thought intently of her warning that she did not care for clothes, dancing, country clubs. Ruth would have been caressingly surprised had she known the thought and worried consciousness he gave to the problem of planning parties for her. Ideas were always popping up in the midst of his work, and never giving him rest till he had noted them down on memo papers. He carried them about on the backs of envelopes, such notes as these. Join Country Club. Take R. Dances there? Baskets of fruit for R. Invite Mason W. Lunch. Organize chair tour NY to SF. Newspaper men on tour, probably Forbes. Remember Walter's new altitude, 16,954. R to Astor Roof. Rim, Country, C. He did get a card to the Peace Waters Country Club and take Ruth to a dance there. She seemed to know every other member and danced eloquently. He took her to the Josiah Bagby's for dinner, to the first night of a summer musical comedy. But he was still the stranger in New York, and parties are not to be had by tipping waiters and buying tickets. Half of the half-dozen affairs which they attended were of her inspiration. He was invited to go yachting at Larchmont, motoring, swimming on Long Island, with friends of herself and her brothers. 
One evening that strikes into Carl's memory of those days of the Pace du Tendre is the evening on which Phil Donnelly insisted on celebrating a Yale baseball victory by taking them to dinner in the Oak Room of the Ritz-Carlton, under whose alabaster lights among the cosmopolites they dined elaborately and smoked slim, imported cigarettes. The thin music of violins took them into the lonely gray groves of the land of wandering tunes, till Phil began to talk, disclosing to them a devotion to beauty, a satirical sense of humor, and a final acceptance of Carl as his friend. A hundred other parties Carl planned while dining alone at inferior restaurants. A hundred times he took ten-cent dessert instead of an exciting fifteen-cent strawberry shortcake to save money for those parties. Out of such sordid thoughts of nickel coins is built a love, enduring, and even tolerable before breakfast coffee. Yet always to him their real life was in simple jaunts out of doors, arranged without considering other people. Her father seemed glad of that. He once said to Carl, giving him a cigar, "'You children had better not let Aunt Emma know that you are enjoying yourselves as you want to. How is the automobile business doing?' It would be pleasant to relate that Carl was inspired by love to put so much of that celebrated American quality punch into his work that the tour car was sweeping the market, or to picture with quietly falling tears the pathos of his business failure at the time when he most needed money. As a matter of fact, the tour car affairs were going as, in real life, most businesses go just fairly well. A few cars were sold. There were prospects of other sales. The Van Zale Corporation neither planned to drop the tour car nor elected our young hero as vice president of the corporation. In June, Gertrude Cowles and her mother left for Jeroleman. Carl had, since Christmas, seen them about once a month. Gertie had at first represented an, an unhappy old friend to whom he had to be kind. Then, as she seemed never to be able to give up the desire to see him tied down, whether by her affection or by his work, Carl came to regard her as an irritating foe of the freedom which he prized the more because of the increasing bondage of the office. The last stage was pure indifference to her. Gertie was either a chance for simple sweetness which he failed to take, or she was a peril which he had escaped, according to one's view of her. But in any case, he had missed or escaped her, as a romantic hero escaped fire, flood, and plot. She meant nothing to him, never could again. Life had flowed past her, as except in novels with plots, most lives do flow past temporary and fortuitous points of interest. Gertie was farther from him now than those dancing Hawaiian girls whom Ruth and he had hoped some day to see. Yet, by her reaching out for his liberty, Gertie had made him prize Ruth. The first of July, 1913. Ruth left for Patton Kerr's country house in the Berkshires near Pitfield. Carl wrote her every day. He told her, apropos of tour cars and roof gardens and aviation records and Sunday motorcycling with Bobby Winslow, that he loved her. He even made, at the end of his letters, the old-fashioned lines of crosses to represent kisses. Whenever he hinted how much he missed her, how much he wanted to feel her startle in his arms, he wondered what she would read out of it, wondered if she would put the letter under her pillow. She answered every other day with friendly letters, droll in their descriptions of the people she met. His call of love she did not answer, directly, but she admitted she missed their playtimes. And once she wrote him, late on a cold Berkshire night, with a black rain and wind like a baying bloodhound. It is so still in my room, and so wild outside, that I am frightened. I have tried to make myself smart in a blue silk dressing gown, and a tosh lace breakfast cap, and I will write neatly with a quill pen from the Mayfair. But, just the same, I am a lonely baby, and I want you here to comfort me. Would you be too shocked to come? I would put a Navajo blanket on my bed, and a papier-mâché Turkish dagger and head of Othello over my bed, and pretend it was a cozy corner. That is, of course, if they still have papier-mâché ornaments. I suppose they still have in Harlem and Brooklyn. 
we would sit very quietly in two wicker chairs on either side of my fireplace and listen to the swollen brook in the ravine just below my window. But with no hawk here, the wind keeps wailing that Pan is dead, that there won't ever again be any sunshine in the valley, dear. It really isn't safe to be writing like this. After reading it, you will suppose that it's just you that I am lonely for. But, of course, I'd be glad for Phil or Puggy Cruden or your nice, solemn Walter McManus or any suitor who would make foolish noises and hide me from the wind's haunting. Now I will seal this up and not send it in the morning. Your playmate Ruth. Here is one small kiss on the forehead, but remember, it is just because of the wind and rain. Presumably she did mail the letter. At least he received it. He carried her letters in his side pocket of his coat till the envelopes were worn at the edges, nearly covered with smudged pencil notes about things he wanted to keep in mind, and would, of course, have kept in mind without making notes. He kept finding new meanings in her letters. He wanted them to indicate that she loved him, and any ambiguous phrase signified successively that she loved, laughed at, loathed, and loved him. Once he got up from bed to take another look at her letter and see whether she had said, I hope you had a dear good time at the Explorers Club dinner, or I hope you had a good time, dear. Carl was entirely sincere in his worried investigation of her state of mind. He knew that both Ruth and he had the instability as well as the initiative of a vagabond. So quickly could either of them break love's alliance if bored. Carl himself, being anything but bored, was as faithfully devoted as the least enterprising of moral young men. He forgot Gertie, did not write to Istra Nash, the artist, and when the Van Zale office got a new telephone girl, a tall, languorous brunette with shadowy eyes and fine cheeks, he did not even smile at her. But was Ruth so bound? She still refused to admit even that she could fall in love. He knew that Ruth and he were not romantic characters, but everyday people with a tendency to quarrel and demand and be slack. He knew that even if the rose dream came true, there would be drab spots on it. And now that she was away, with Lennox and Polo to absorb her, could the gauche, ignorant Carl Erickson that he privately knew himself to be retain her interest? Late in July he received an invitation to spend a weekend, Friday to Tuesday, with Ruth, at the Patton Curs. End of chapter 38《ハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッ and how, when the water is running out, the inside of the bowl is covered with a whitish film of water, which swiftly peels off. He recalled the cracked white paint of a steamer's ventilator, the abruptly stopping mmm of the foghorn, the vast smoky roof of a Philadelphia train shed, clamorous with the train bells, of a strange town giving a sense of mystery to the travelers stepping from the car for a moment, to stretch his legs, an ugly junction station platform, with resin oozing from the heavy planks in the spring sun, the polished binnacle of the S.S. Panama. He expected keen joy in new fields and hills. Yet all the way north he was trying to hold the train back. In a few minutes now he would see Ruth, and at this hour he did not even know definitely that he liked her. He could not visualize her, he could see the sleeve of her blue corduroy jacket. Her eyes he could not see. She was a stranger. Had he idealized her? He was apologetic for his unflattering doubt. But of what sort was she? The train was stopping at her station with rattling windows and a despairing grind of wheels. Carl seized his overnight bag and suitcase with fictitious enthusiasm. 
he was in a panic. Emerging from the safe, impersonal train upon the platform, he saw her. She was waving to him from a one-seated phaeton, come along to meet him. And she was the adorable, the perfect comrade. He thought jubilantly as he strode along the platform. She's wonderful. Love her. Should say I do. When they drove under the elms, past white cottages in the village green, while they were talking so lightly and properly that none of the New England gossips could be wounded in the sense of propriety, Carl was learning her anew. She was an outdoor girl now, in low collared blouse and white linen skirt. He rejoiced in her modulating laugh, the contrast of blue eyes and dark brows under her Panama hat, her full dark hair, with a lock sun drenched her bare throat, boyishly brown, femininely smooth, the sweet, clean, fine textured girl flesh, of the hollow of one shoulder faintly to be seen in the shadow of her broad, drooping collar. One hand, with a curious ring of rose quartz and steel points, excitedly pounding a tattoo of greeting with a whip-handle. Her spirited irreverences regarding the people they passed, chatter which showed the world transformed as though ruby glass, a Ruth radiant, understanding his comrade. She was all that he had believed during her absence, and doubted while he was coming to her. But he had no time to repent of his doubt, now. So busy was he exulting to himself, slipping a hand under her arm. Lover, I should say I do. The carriage rolled out of town with the rhythmic creak of a country buggy, climbed a hill range by means of the black, oily state road, and turned upon a sandy side road. A brook ran beside them. Sunny fields alternated with woods leaf-floored, quiet, holy, miraculous after the weary city. Below was a vista of downward-sloping fields, divided by creeper-covered stone walls, then a sun-meshed valley set with ponds like shining glass dishes on a green tablecloth. Beyond all, a long reach of hillsides, covered with unbroken fleecy forests, like green down. So much unspoiled country, and yet there's people herded in subways, complained Carl. They drove along a level road, lined with wild raspberry bushes, and full of a thin jade light from the shading maples. They gossiped of the Pattenkers and the Berkshires, of the difference between the professional English weekender and the American who still has something of the naive provincial delight of going visiting, of New York and the Dunaways, but their talk lulled to a nervous hush. It seemed to him that a great voice cried from the clouds, It is beside Ruth that you are sitting, Ruth whose arm you feel. In silence he caught her left hand. As he slowly drew back her hand and the reins with it, to stop the ambling horse, the two children stared straight at each other, hungry, tremendously afraid. Their kiss, not only their lips, but their spirits, met without one reserve. A straining, long kiss, as though they were forcing their lips into one body of living flame a kiss in which his eyes were blind to the enchantment of the jade light about them, his ears deaf to brook and rustling forest. All his senses were concentrated on the close warmth of her misty lips, the curve of her young shoulder, her woman's sweetness and longing. Then his senses forgot even her lips and floated off into a blurred trance of bodiless happiness, the kiss of Nirvana, no foreign thought or trains or people or the future came now to drag him to earth. It was the most devoted, most sacred moment he had known. As he became again conscious of lips and cheek and brave shoulders and of her widespread fingers gripping his upper arm, she was slowly breaking the spell of the kiss, but again and again she kissed him, hasty, savage tokens of rejoicing possession. She cried, I do know now. I do love you. Blessed. 
In silence they stared into the woods while her fingers smoothed his knuckles. Her eyes were faint with tears in the magic jade light. I didn't know a kiss could be like that, she marveled presently. I would have believed selfish Ruth couldn't give all of herself. Yes, it was the whole universe. Oh, dear, I wasn't experimenting that time. I'm glad, glad to know I can really love, not just curiosity. I've wanted you so all day I thought four o'clock would ever come. Oh, darling, my dear, dear Hawk, I don't even know for sure I'd like you when you came. Sometimes I wanted terribly to have your silly, foolish, childish, pale hair on my breast. Such hair, ladies' hair. But sometimes I didn't want to see you at all and I was frightened at the thought of your coming, and I fussed around in the house till Mrs. Pat laughed at me and accused me of being in love, and I denied it. And she was right. Blessed, I was scared to death all the way up here. I didn't think you could be as wonderful as I knew you were. That sounds mixed, but, oh, blessed, blessed, you really love me? You really love me? It's hard to believe I've actually heard you say it, and I love you so completely. Everything. I love you. That is such an adorable spot to kiss just below your ear, she said. Darling, keep me safe in the little house of arms, where there's only room for you and me. No room for offices or Aunt Emma's. But now we must hurry on. If a wagon had been coming along the road, as they entered the rhododendron lime drive of the Peyton Kerr place, Carl remembered a detail, not important, but usual. Oh, yes, he said. I've forgotten to propose. Need you proposals sound like contracts and all those other dull forms. Not like that kiss. See, there's Pat Kerr, Jr., waving at us. Can you just make him out there on the upper balcony? He's a darlingest child with ash-colored hair, cut Dutch down. I wonder if you didn't look like him when you were a boy, with your light hair. Not a chance. I was a grubby kid. Made noises. Gee, what a bully place in the house. Will you marry me? Yes, I will. It is a dear place. Mrs. Pat is... When? Always fussing over it. She plants narcissus and crocuses in the woods. So you find them growing wild. I like those awnings against the white walls. May I consider that we are engaged then, Miss Winslow? Engaged for the next marriage? Oh, no, not engaged, dear. Don't you know it's one of my principles? But look, not to be engaged, Hawk. Everybody brings the cunning old jokes out of the mothballs when you're engaged. I'll marry you, but... Marry me next month, August. September? Nope. Please, Ruthie. Ah, oh, yes, September. Nice month. September is autumn. Harvest moon and apples to swipe. Come on, September. Well, perhaps September. We'll see. Oh, Hawk, dear, can you conceive of us actually sitting here and solemnly discussing being married? Us, the babes in the woods? And I've only known you three days or so, seems to me. Well, as I was saying, perhaps I'll marry you in September. Mm, frightens me to think of it. Frightens me and awes me and uh, amazes me and to death all at once. That is, I shall marry you unless you take to wearing pearl-gray derbies or white evening ties with black edging or kill Mason in a duel or do something equally disgraceful. But engaged I will not be. And we'll put the money for a diamond ring into a big Davenport. Are we going to be dreadfully poor? Oh, not pawn-shop poor. I made Van Zyl boost my salary last week, and with my Turricar stock I'm getting a little over $4,000 a year. Is that lots or little? Well, it will give us a decent apartment and a nearly decent maid, I guess, and if the Turricar keeps going, we can beat it off for a year, wandering after maybe three or four years. I hope so. Here we are. That's Mrs. Pat waiting for us. 
The Patton Kerr house, set near the top of the highest hill in the range of the Berkshires, stood out white against a slope of crisp green and old manor house of long lines and solid beams, with striped awnings of red and white, and in front a brick terrace with basket chairs, a swinging couch, and a wicker tea table, already welcoming spread with a service of Royal Dalton. From the terrace one saw miles of valley and hills and villages strung on rambling river. The valley was a golden bowl filled with the peace of afternoon a world of sun and listening woods. On the terrace waited a woman of thirty-five, of clever face, a bit worn in the edges, carefully coiffed hair, and careless white blouse with a tweed walking skirt. She was gracefully holding out her hand, greeting Carl. "'It's terribly good of you to come clear out into our wilderness.' She was interrupted by the bouncing appearance of a stocky, handsome, red-faced, full-chinned, curly-black-haired man of forty in riding breeches and boots, and a silk shirt, with him an exciting small boy in rompers, Pat and Kerr, Sr., and Junior. "'Here you are,' Sr. observantly remarked. "'Glad to see you, Erickson. You and Ruthie have been a deuce of a time coming up from town. Holding hands along the road, eh? Lord, these aviators!' "'Pat! Animal!' protested Mrs. Kerr and Ruth simultaneously. All right, I'll be good. Saw you fly at Nassau Boulevard, Erickson. Turned my horn loose and hooted till they thought I was a militant. Like Ruthie here. Lord, what flying, what flying. I'd like to see you race Winterman Verdens, Ruthie. Will you show Mr. Erickson where his room is? Oh, has poor old Pat got to go and drag a servant away from reading? Town topics, hey? I will, Pat, said Ruth. I will, Daddy, cried Pat, Jr., no, my son, I guess maybe Ruthie had better do it. There's a certain look in her eyes. Baltic! Salamander! Ruth and Carl passed through the wide colonial hall with mahogany tables and portraits of the Kerrs and the sword of Colonel Patton. At the far end was an open door, and a glimpse of an old-fashioned garden, radiant with hollyhocks and canterbury bells. It was a world of utter content. As they climbed the curving stairs, Ruth tucked her arm in his, saying, "'Now do you see why I won't be engaged? Pat Kerr is the best chum in the world, yet he finds even a possible engagement wildly humorous, like mothers-in-law or poets or falling on your ear. But, gee, Ruth, are you going to marry me?' "'You little child, my little boy hawk, of course I'm going to marry you. Do you think I would miss my chance of a cabin in the Rockies?' my famous hawk, what everybody cheered at Nassau Boulevard. She opened the door of his room and with a deferential, Thy chambers, my lord. Come down quickly, she said. We mustn't miss a moment of these days. I am frank with you about how glad I am to have you here. You must be good to me. You will prize my love a little, won't you? Before he could answer, she had run away. After half homecomings and false homecomings, the adventurer had really come home. He inspected the gracious room, its chintz hangings, four-poster bed, low wicker chair by the fireplace, fresh Cherokee roses on the mantel, a room of cheerfulness and open space. He stared into the woods where a cool light lay on moss and fern. He did not need to remember Ruth's kisses, for each breath of hilltop air, each emerald of moss, each shining mahogany surface in the room, repeated to him that he had found the grail, whose other name is love. Saturday they loafed over breakfast, the sun licking the treetops and the ravine outside the windows, and they motored with the curs to Lennox, returning through the darkness. Till midnight they talked on the terrace. They loafed again the next morning, and let the fresh air dissolve the office grime which had been coating his spirit. They were so startlingly original as to be simple-hearted country lovers. In the afternoon, declining Kerr's offer of a car, and rambled off on bicycles. From her eyes they saw water gleaming among the trees. The sullen green of pines set off the silvery green of barley, and an orchard climbed the next rise. The smoky shadow of another hill range promised long, cool forest roads. Crows were flying overhead. Going where they would, the aviator and the girl who read psychology, modern lovers, 
stood hand in hand as though the age of machinery were a myth, as though he were a piping minstrel and she a shepherdess. Before them was the open road, and all around them the hum of bees. A close, listless heat held Monday afternoon, even on the hilltop. The clay tennis court was baking. The worn bricks of the terrace reflected a furnace glow. The curs had disappeared for a nap. Carl, lounging with Ruth on the swinging couch in the shade, thought of the slaves in New York offices and tenements. Then, because he would himself be back in an office next day, he let the glare of the valley soothe him with its wholesome heat. "'Certainly would like a swim,' he remarked. "'Couldn't we bike down to Fisher's Pond or maybe take the ford?' "'Let's. But there's no bathhouse. Put a bathing suit under your dress. Sun'll dry it in no time after the swim.' "'As you command, my liege.' And she ran in to change. They motored down to Fisher's Pond, which is a lake, and stopped in a natural wooded opening, like a dim-lighted green room. From it stretched the enameled lake, the further side reflecting unbroken woods. The nearer water edge was exquisite in its cleanliness. They saw perch fantastically floating over the pale sand bottom, among scattered reeds whose watery green stalks were like the thin columns of a dancing hall for small fishes. The surface of the lake, satiny as the palm of a girl's hand, broke in the tiniest of ripples against white quartz pebbles on the hot shore. Cool, flashing, golden-sanded, the lake coaxed them out of their forest room. "'A lot like the Minnesota lakes, only smaller,' said Carl. "'I'm going right in. About ready for a swim? Come on.' "'I'm afraid.' She suddenly plumped on the earth and hugged her skirts about her ankles. "'Why, blessed! What are you scared of? No sharks here, and no undertow. Nice white sand.' "'Oh, Hawk, I was silly.' I felt I was such an independent modern woman, uh, uh, and I aren't. I've always said it was silly for girls to swim in a woman's bathing suit. Skirts are so cumbersome, so I put on a boy's bathing suit under my dress, and I'm terribly embarrassed. Why, blessed! Well, I guess you'll have to decide. His voice was somewhat shaky. Awful scared of Carl. Yes, I thought I wouldn't be with you, but— I'm self-conscious as can be. Well, gee, I don't know, of course. Well, I'll jump in, and you can decide. He peeled off his white flannels and stood in his blue bathing suit, not statue-like, not very brown now, but trim-waisted, shapely armed, wonderfully clean of neck and jaw. With a wee, he dashed into the water and swam out, overhand. As he turned over and glanced back, his heart caught to see her standing on the creamy sand, a shy, elfin figure, in a boy's bathing suit of black wool, a woman and slim boy in one, silken-throated and graceful-limbed, curiously smaller than when dressed. Her white skirt and blouse lay tumbled about her ankles. She raised rosy arms to hide her flushed face and her eyes, as she cried, "'Don't look!' He obediently swam on with a tenderness more poignant than longing. He heard her splashing behind him, and turned again to see her racing through the water. Those soft yet not narrow shoulders rose and fell sturdily under the wet black wool. Her eyes shone, and she was all comradey boy, save for her dripping, splendid hair. Singing, Come on, lazy! She headed across the pond. He swam beside her, reveling in the well-being of cool water and warm air till they reached the solemn shade beneath the trees on the other side and floated in the dark, still water, splashing idle hands, gazing into forest hollows, spying upon the brisk business of squirrels among the acorns. Back at the greenwood room, Ruth wrapped her sailor blouse about her, and they squatted like unself-conscious children on the beach, while from a field a distant locust fiddled his august fandango, and in flame-colored pride an oriole went by. Fresh sky, sunfish like tropic shells in the translucent water, arching reeds dipping their olive-green points in the water, wavelets, rushing against a gray, neglected rowboat. And beside him, Ruth. Musingly, they built a castle of sand, an hour of understanding so complete 
that it made the heart melancholy. When he sighed, Kitty Lake, come on, blessed, we're dry now. It seemed that they could never again know such rapt tranquility. Yet they did, for that evening when they stood on the terrace, trying to forget that he must leave her and go back to the lonely city in the morning, when the mist reached chilly tentacles up from the valley, they kissed a shy good-bye, and Carl knew that life's real adventure is not adventuring, but finding the playmate with whom to quest life's meaning. End of chapter 39「Chapter Forty of Trail of the Hawk The Sleep of Ox recording is in the public domain recording by Mike Vendetti Trail of the Hawk by Sinclair Lewis Chapter Forty After six festival months of married life in April or May nineteen fourteen, the happy Mrs. Carl Erickson did not have many modern theories of marriage in general, though it was her theory that she had such theories. Like a majority of intelligent men and women, Ruth was, in her rebellion against the canonical marriage of slipper-warning and obedience, emphatic but vague. She was of precise opinion regarding certain details of marriage, but in general as inconsistent as her library. It is a human characteristic to be belligerently sure as to whether one prefers plush or tan upholstery on car seats, but not to consider whether government ownership of railroads will improve upholstering. To know with certainty of perception that it is a bore to have one's husband laugh at one's pet economy of matches or string or ice, but to be blandly willing to leave all theories of polygamy, polandry, monogamy, and varietism to the clever Russian Jews. As regards details, Ruth definitely did want a bedroom of her own, a desire which her mother would have regarded as somehow immodest. She definitely did want shaving and hair-brushing kept in the background. She did not want Carl, the lover, to drift into Carl, the husband. She did not want him to lose touch with other people, and she wanted to keep the spice of madness which from the first had seasoned her comradeship. These things she delightfully had in May 1914. They were largely due to her own initiative, Carl's drifting theories of social structure, concerned for the most part the wages of workmen and the ridiculousness of class distinctions. Reared in the farming district, the amateur college, the garage, and the hangar, he had not, despite imagination, devoted two seconds to such details as the question of whether there was freedom and repose. Not to speak of a variety of taste as regards opening windows and sleeping diagonally across a bed, in having separate bedrooms, much though he had been persuaded to read of modern fiction. His race still believed that marriage bells and roses were the proper portions of marriage to think about. It was due to Ruth, too, that they had so amiable a flat. Carl had been made careless of surroundings by years of hotels and furnished rooms. There was less real significance for him in the beauty of his first home than in the fact that they too had a bathroom of their own, that he no longer had to go, clad in a drab bathrobe, laden with shaving materials and a towel and talcum powder and a broken hand mirror and a toothbrush, like a perambulating drugstore toilet counter, down a boarding-house hall to that modified hall bedroom with a tin tub, which his doctor landlord had called a bathroom. Pictures, it must be admitted, give a room an air pleasant it is to sit in large chairs by fireplaces and feel yourself a landed gentleman. But nothing filled Carl with a more delicate and truly spiritual satisfaction than having a porcelain tub, plenty of hot water, and the privilege of leaving his shaving brush in the Erickson bathroom, with a fair certainty of finding it there when he wanted to shave in a hurry. But careless of surroundings or not, Carl was stirred when, on their return from honeymooning in the Adirondacks, he carried Ruth over the threshold, and they stood together in the living room of their home. It was a room to live in and laugh in. The woodwork was white enameled, the walls covered with gray Japanese paper, 
There were no portieres between living room and dining room and small hall, so that the three rooms, with their light reflecting walls, gave an effect of spaciousness to rather a cramped and old-fashioned apartment. There were not many pictures and no bric-a-brac, yet the rooms were not bare, but clean and trim and distinguished. With the large davenport and the wing chair, chintz cushioned brown willow chairs, and Ruth's upright piano, excellent mahogany, and a few good rugs, there were only two or three vases, and they genuinely intended for holding flowers, and there was a bare mantelpiece that rested the eyes over the fuzzy clean gas log. The pictures were chosen because they led the imagination on, etchings and color prints largely by unknown artists, like windows looking on delightful country. The chairs assembled naturally in groups. The whole unit of three rooms suggested people talking. It was home, first and last, though it was one cell in one layer of a seven-story building. On a street walled in with such buildings in a city which lined up more than three hundred of such streets from its southern tip to its northern limit along the Hudson, and threw in a couple of million people in Brooklyn and the Bronx. They lived in the nineties, between Broadway and Riverside Drive, a few blocks from the Winslow House in distance, but one generation away in matter of decoration. The apartment house itself was completely old-fashioned, with an intermittent elevator run by an intermittent Negro youth, who gave most of his time to the telephone switchboard and mysterious duties in the basement also with a downstairs hall that was narrow and carpeted and lined with offensively dark wood. But they could see the Hudson from their living room, on the sixth floor at the back of the house. The agent assured them that probably not till the end of time would there be anything but low private houses between them and the river. They were not haunted by Aunt Emma Truegate Winslow, and Ruth, who had long been oppressed by late Victorian bric-a-brac, and American Louis the Fifteenth furniture, so successfully adopted elimination as the keynote that there was not one piece of furniture bought for the purpose of indicating that Mr. and Mrs. Carl Erickson were well-to-do. She dared to tell friends who, before the wedding, inquired what she wanted, that checks were welcome, and need not be monogrammed. Even Aunt Emma had been willing to send a check provided they were properly married at St. George's Church. Consequently, their six rooms showed a remarkable absence of such usual wedding presents as prints of the smugly smiling and euphoric Mona Lisa, three muffin stands in three degrees of marquetry, three electro royalists, four punch bowls, three sets of almond dishes, a pair of bird carvers that did not carve, a bust of Dante, in new art marble, or a deluxe set of de Mosapont translated by a worthy lady with a French lexicon. Instead, they bought what they wanted, rather an important thing to do, but, like most importances, thoroughly worth while. The living room was their own. Carl's bedroom was white and simple, though spotty with aviation medals and silver cups, and monoplanes sketchily rendered in gold, and signed photographs of aviators. Ruth's bedroom was also plain and white and dull Japanese gray, a simple room with that simplicity of hand embroidery, real lace, and fine linen appreciated by exclamatory women friends. She taught Carl to say, Dog, instead of dog, for dog. Watwa, instead of water, for water. Whether she was more correct in her pronunciation or not, does not matter. New York said dog, and it amused him just then to be very Eastern. She taught him the theory of house lighting. Carl had no financial objection to unshaded incandescent bulbs glowing from the ceiling, but he came to like the shaded electric bulbs which Ruth installed in the living room. When she introduced four candles as sole lighting of the dining room table, however, he grumbled loudly at his inability to see what he was eating. She retired to her bedroom, and he huffily went out to get a cigar. At the cigar counter, he repented of all the unkind things he had ever done or could possibly do, and returned to eat humble pie, and eat it by candlelight. Inside of two weeks, 
One of the things which Carl had always known was that the harmonious candlelight brought them closer together at dinner. The teaching in this period of adjustments was not all on Ruth's part. It was due to Carl's insistence that she tried to discover what her theological beliefs really were. She admitted that only at twilight vespers, with a gale of violins in an arched roof, did she really worship in church. She did not believe that priests and ministers, who seemed to be ordinary men as regards earthly things, had any extraordinary knowledge of the mysteries of heaven. Yet she took it for granted that she was a good Christian. She rarely disagreed with the Dunlobbies, who were Catholics, or her Aunt Emma, who regarded anything but high church Episcopalianism as bad form, or her brother Mason, who was an uneasy Unitarian, or Carl, who was an unaggressive agnostic. Of the four, it was Carl who seemed to have the greatest interest in religions. He blurred out such monologues as, I wonder if it isn't pure egotism that makes a person believe that the religion he is born to is the best. My country, my religion, my wife, my business. We think that whatever is ours is necessarily sacred, or, in other words, that we are gods. And then we call it faith and patriotism. The Hindu or the Christian is equally ready to prove to you, and mind you, he may be a wise old man with a beard, that his national religion is obviously the only one. Find out what you yourself really do think, and if you turn out a sun-worshipper or a hard-shell Baptist, why, good luck. If you don't think for yourself, then you're admitting that your theory of happiness is the old dog asleep in the sun. And maybe he is happier than the student. But I think you like to experiment with life. His arguments were neither original nor especially logical. They were largely given to him by Bone Stillman, Professor Fraser, and chance paragraphs in stray radical magazines. But to Ruth, politely reared in a house with three maids, where it was as tactless to discuss God as to discuss sex, his deferences seemed terrifyingly new. She was not the first who had complacently gone to church after reading Bernard Shaw, but she did try to follow Carl's loose reasoning to find out what she thought and what the spiritual fashions of her neighborhood made her think, she thought. The process gave her many anxious hours of alternating impatience with fixed religious dogmas and loneliness for the comfortable refuge of a personal God whose yearning had spoken to her in the Gregorian chant. She could never get herself to read more than two chapters of any book on the subject, nor did she get much light from the conversation. One set of people supposed that Christianity had so entirely disappeared from intelligence circles that it was not worth discussion. Another set supposed that no one but cranks ever thought of doubting the essentials of Christianity, and that, therefore, it was not worth discussion and to a few superb women who, she knew, their religion was too sweet a reality to be subjected to the noisy chatter of discussion. Gradually, Ruth forgot to think often of the matter, but it was always in the back of her mind. They were happy, Carl and Ruth. To their flats came such of Ruth's friends as she kept because she liked them for themselves, with a fantastic assortment of personages and awkward rovers whom the ex-aviator knew. The Ericsons made an institution of the bruncheon, breakfast luncheon, at which coffee and eggs and deviled kidneys, a table of auction bridge, and a davenport of talk and a wing chair of Sunday papers were to be had on Sunday morning from ten to one. At bruncheon, Walter McMoney's told to Florence Cruden his experiences in exploring southern Greenland by airplane, with the Schillis Banning Exposition. At bruncheon, Bobby Winslow, now an intern, talked baseball with Carl. At bruncheon, Phil Donnelly regarded cynically all the people he did not know and played piquet in a corner with Ruth's father. Carl and Ruth joined the Peace Waters Country Club, and in the spring of 1914 went there nearly every Sunday afternoon for tennis and a dance. Carl refused golf, however. He always repeated a shabby joke about the shame of taking advantage of such a tiny ball. He seemed content to stick to office, home, and tennis court. It was Ruth who planned their weekend trips, proposed at 8 a.m. Sunday, 
and began at two that afternoon. They explored the tangled rocks and woods of Lloyd's Neck on Long Island, sleeping in an abandoned shack, curled together like kittens. They swooped on a Dutch village in New Jersey, spent the night with an old farmer, and attended the Dutch Reformed Church. They tramped from New Haven to Hartford over Easter. Carl was always ready for their gypsy journeys. He responded to Ruth's visions of foaming South Sea Isles, but he rarely sketched such pictures of himself. He had given all of himself to joy in Ruth. Like many men called adventurers, he was ready for anything but content with anything. It was Ruth who was finding new voyages. She kept up her sentiment work and progressed to an active interest in the Women's Trade Union League and took part in picketing during a Panama hat worker strike. She may have had more curiosity than principle, but she did badger policemen pluckily. She was studying Italian, the Montessori method. Cooking, she taught new dishes to her maid. She adopted a careless suggestion of Carl and violently increased the maid's salary, thereby shaking the rock-ribbed foundations of Upper West Side society. In nothing did she find greater satisfaction than in being neither the bride nor the little woman, nor any like degrading thing which recently married girls are by their sentimental spinster friends expected to be. She did not whisper the intimate details of her honeymoon to other young married women. She did not run about quantity and tenderly telling of her difficulty with household work. When a purring baby-talking acquaintance gurgled, How did the Ruthie bride spend her morning? Did she cook some little dainty for her husband? Nothing, bourgeois, I'm sure. In reply, Ruth pleasantly observed, Not a chance. The Ruthie bride cursed out the janitor for not shooting up a dainty cabbage in the dumb waiter, and then counted up her husband's cigarette coupons and skipped right down to the premium parlors with him and got him a pair of pale blue Boston garters and a cunning granite ware stew pan, and then sponged lunch off Olive Donnelly. But nothing bourgeois. Such experience told to Carl he found diverting. He seemed, in the spring of 1914, to want no others. End of chapter 40「Forty One of the Trail of the Hawk. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Vendetti. MikeVendetti.com. Trail of the Hawk by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter 41. The apparently satisfactory development of the Touricar in the late spring of 1914 was the result of an uneconomical expenditure of energy on the part of Carl. Personally, he followed by letter the trail of every amateur aviator, every motoring big game hunter. He never let up for an afternoon. Van Zale had lost interest in the whole matter. Whenever Carl thought of how much the development of the tour car business depended upon himself, he was uneasy about the future and bent more closely over his desk. On his way home, swaying on a subway strap, his pleasant sensation of returning to Ruth was interrupted by worry in regard to things he might have done at the office. Nights he dreamed of lists of prospects. Late in May, he was disturbed for several days by headaches, lassitude, nausea. He lied to Ruth. Guess I have eaten something at lunch that was a little off. You know what these restaurants are. He admitted, however, that he felt like a symptom. He stuck to the office, though his chief emotion about life and business was that he wished to go off somewhere and lie down and die gently. Directly after a Sunday bruncheon, at which he was silent and looked washed out, he went to bed with typhoid fever. For six weeks he was ill. He seemed daily to lose more of the boyishness which all his life had made him want to dance in the sun. That loss was to Ruth like a snickering hobgoblin attending the specter of death. Staying by him constantly, forgetting, in the intensity of her care, even to want credit for virtue, taking one splash at her tired eyes with boric acid and dashing back to his bed. She mourned and mourned for her lost boy. While she hid her fear and kept her blouses fresh and her hair well coiffed, and mothered the stern man who lay so dreadfully still in the bed. He was not shaved every day. 
He had a pale beard under his hollow cheeks. Even when he was out of delirium, even when he was comparatively strong, he never said anything gaily foolish for the sake of being young and noisy with her. During convalescence, Carl was so wearily gentle that she hoped the little boy she loved was coming back to dwell in him. But the hawk's wings seemed broken. For the first time, Carl was afraid of life. He sat and worried, going over the possibilities of the Turricar and the positions he might get if the Turricar failed. He was willing to loaf by the window all day, his eyes on a narrow, blood-red stripe and a Navajo blanket on his knees, along which he incessantly ran a fingernail back and forth, back and forth for whole quarter-hours while she read aloud from Kipling and London and Conrad, hoping to rekindle the spirit of daring. One sweet drop was in their cup of iron. As woodland playmates, they could never have known such intimacy as hovered about them when she rested her head lightly against his knees, and they watched the Hudson, the storms and flurries of light on its waves, the windy clouds and the processions of barges, the beetle-like ferries, and the great steamers for Albany. They talked in half-sentences, understanding the rest. Tough in winter. Might be a good trip. Carl's hand was always demanding her thick hair, but he stroked it gently. The coarse, wholesome vigor was drained from him. Part even of his slang went with it. His G was not explosive. He took to watching her like a solemn baby when she moved about the room. Thus she found the little boy Carl again, laughed full-throated, and secretly cried over him. As his sternness passed into a wistful obedience, he was not quite the same impudent boy whose naughtiness she had loved. But the good child who came in his place did trust her so, depended upon her so. When Carl was strong enough, they went for three weeks to Point Pleasant on the Jersey coast, where the pines and breakers from the open sea yield his weakness and his multitudinous worries. They even swam once, and Carl played at learning two new dances, strangely called the Foxtrot and the Lulu Fado. Their hotel was a vast barn, all porches, white flannels, and handsome young Jews chatting tremendously with young Jewesses, but its ballroom floor was smooth and Ruth had lacked music and excitement for so long that she danced every night and conducted an amiable flirtation with a mysterious young man of Harvard accent, Jewish features, fine brown eyes, and tortoiseshell-rimmed eyeglasses, while Carl looked on, a contented wallflower. They came back to town with ocean breeze and pine scent in their throats and sea sparkle in their eyes, and Carl promptly tied himself to the office desk as though Sickness and recovery had never given him a vision of play. Ruth had not taken the Point Pleasant dances seriously, but as day on day she stifled in a half-darkened flat that summer, she sometimes sobbed at the thought of the moon-path on the sea, the reflection of lights on the ballroom floor, the wave-like swish of music mad feet. The flat was hot, dead. The summer heat was unrelenting as bedclothes drawn over the head and lashed down. Flies in sneering circles mocked the listless hand she flipped at them. Too hot to wear many clothes, yet hating the disorder of a flimsy negligee, she panted in by a window, while the venomous sun glared on tin roofs, and a few feet away snarled the ceaseless trrrr of a steam riveter that was creating new flats to shut off her view of the Hudson. In the lava-paved backyard was the insistent, file-like voice of the janitor's son, who kept piping, Hey, Billy! Hey, Billy! He's got a girl! Billy got a girl! Hey, Billy! She imagined herself going down and slaughtering him, vividly saw herself waiting for the elevator, venturing into the hot sepulchre of the back areaway, and there becoming too languid to complete the task of ridding the world of the dear child. She was horrified to discover what she had been imagining, and presently imagined it all over again. Two blocks across from her, seen through the rising walls of the new apartment houses, were the drab windows of a group of run-down tenements, 
which broke the sleek respectability of the well-to-do quarter. In those windows Ruth observed foreign-looking idle women, not very clean, who had nothing to do after they had completed half an hour of slovenly housework in the morning. They watched their neighbors breathlessly. They peered out with the petty, virulent curiosity of the workless at whatever passed in the streets below them. Fifty times a day they could be seen to lean far out on their fire escapes and follow with slowly craning necks and unblinking eyes the passing of something. Ice wagons, undertaker's wagons, Ole Klo men. Ruth surmised, the rest of the time, ragged hair and greasy of wrapper, gum-chewing and yawning, they rested their unlovely stomachs on discolored sofa cushions on the window-sills, and waited for something to appear. Two blocks away they were. Yet to Ruth they seemed to be in the room with her, claiming her as one of their sisterhood. For now she was a useless woman, as they were. She raged with the thought that she might grow to be like them in every respect. She, Ruth Winslow. She wondered if any of them were Norwegians named Ericsson. With the fascination of dread, she watched them as closely as they watched the world, with the hypnotization of unspeakable hopelessness. She had to find her work, something for which the world needed her, lest she be left here useless and unhappy in a flat. In her kitchen she was merely an intruder on the efficient maid, and there was no nursery. She sat apprehensively on the edge of a chair, hating the women at the windows, hating the dull persistent flies, hating the wetness of her forehead and the dampness of her palm, repenting of her hate, and hating again, and taking another cold bath, to be fresh for the homecoming of Carl the tired man whom she had to mother, and whom, of all the world, she did not hate. Even on the many cool days, when the streets in the flat became tolerable, and the vulture-women of the tenements ceased to exist for her, Ruth was not much interested, whether she went out or someone came to see her. Everyone she knew, except the Dunleavies, and a few others, was out of town, and she was tired of all of Dunleavy's mirth and shallow gossip. After her days with Carl in the Valley of the Shadow, Olive was to her a stranger, giggling about strange people. Phil was rather better. He occasionally came in for tea, poked about, stared at the color prints, and said cryptic things about feminism and playing squash. Her settlement house classes were closed for the summer. She brooded over the settlement work and accused herself of caring less for people than for the sensation of being charitable. She wondered if she was a hypocrite. Then she would take another cold bath to be fresh for the homecoming of Carl, the tired man whom she had to mother, and toward whom, of all the world's energies, she knew that she was not hypocritical. This is not the story of Ruth Winslow, but of Carl Erickson. Yet Ruth's stifling days are a part of it, for her unhappiness meant as much to him as it did to her. In the swelter of his office, overlooking, motor-hooting, gasoline-reeking Broadway, he was aware that Ruth was in the flat, buried alive. He made plans for her going away, but she refused to desert him. He tried to arrange for a week more of holiday for them both. He could not. He came to understand that he was now completely a prisoner of business. He was in a rut, both sides of which were hedged with back work that had piled up on him. He had no desire, no ambition, no interest, except in Ruth, and in making the Touricar pay. The Touricar company had never paid expenses as yet. How much longer would old Van Zale be satisfied with millions to come in the future? Perhaps. Carl even took work home with him. Though for Ruth's sake he wanted to go out and play, it really was for her sake he himself liked to play but the disease of perpetual overwork had hold on him. He was glad to have her desert him for an evening now and then, and go out to the Peace Waters Country Club for a dance with Phil and Olive Dunlavy. She felt guilty when she came home and found him still making calculations, but she hummed waltzes while she put on a thin blue silk dressing-gown and took down her hair. 
I can't stand this grubby shut-in prison, she finally snatched at him on an evening when he would not go to the first night of a roof garden. He snarled back. You don't have to. Why don't you go with your bloomin' Phil and Olive? Of course, I don't ever want to go myself. See here, my friend, you have been taking advantage for a long time now of the fact that you were ill. I'm not going to be your nurse indefinitely. She slammed her bedroom door. Later she came stalking out, very dignified, and left the flat. He pretended not to see her. But as soon as the elevator door clanged and the rumbling old car had begun to carry her down away from him, the flat was noisy with her absence. She came home eagerly sorry, to find an eagerly sorry Carl. Then, while they cried together and he kissed her lips, they made a compact that no matter for what reason or through whose fault they might quarrel, they would always settle it before either went to bed. But they were uncomfortably polite for two days, and obviously were so afraid that they might quarrel that they were both prepared to quarrel. Carl had been back at work for less than one month, but he hoped the Turricar was giving enough promise now of positive success to permit him to play during the evening. He rented a Vinzale car for part-time, planned weekend trips, hoped they could spin. Then the whole world exploded. Just at the time when the investigation of twilight sleep indicated that the world might become civilized, the powers plunged into a war whose reason no man has yet discovered. Carl read the headlines on the morning of August 5, 1914, with the delusion of not reading news but history, with himself in the history book. Ten thousand books record the Great War, and how bitterly Europe realized it. This is to record that Carl, like most Americans, did not comprehend it even when recruits for the Kaiser marched down Broadway with German and American flags intertwined, even when his business was threatened. It was too big for his imagination. Every noon he bought himself half a dozen newspaper extras and hurried down to the bulletin boards on the Times and Herald buildings. He pretended that he was a character in one of the fantastic novels about a world war, when he saw such items as Russians invading Prussia. Japs will enter war. Airplane and submarine attacks. English cruiser. Rats, he said. I'm dreaming. There couldn't be a war like that. We're too civilized. I can prove the whole thing's impossible. In the world puzzle, nothing confused Carl more than the question of socialism. He had known as a final fact that the alliance of French and German socialist workmen made war between the two nations absolutely impossible, and his knowledge was proven ignorance, his faith folly. He tentatively bought a socialist magazine or two to find some explanation, and found only greater confusion on the part of the scholars and leaders of the party. They, too, did not understand how it had all happened. They stood amid the ruins of international socialism, sorrowing. If their faith was darkened, how much more so was Carl's vague, untutored optimism about world brotherhood. He had two courses, to discard socialism as a failure, or to stand by it as a course of action which was logical, but had not as yet been able to accomplish its end. He decided to stand by it. He could not see himself plunging into the unutterable pessimism of believing that all of mankind were such beastly fools that, after this, one great sin. They could not repent and turn from tribal murder. And what other remedy was there? If socialism had not prevented the war, neither had monarchy or bureaucracy, bourgeois peace movements, nor the church. With the whole world at war, Carl thought chiefly of his own business. He was not abnormal. The press was filled with bewildered queries as to what would happen to America. For two weeks the automobile business seemed dead, save for a grim activity in war trucks. Van Zyl called in Carl and shook his head over the future of the Touricar, now that all luxuries were threatened. But the Middle West promised a huge crop and prosperity. The East followed, then slowly the South, despite the closed outlet for its cotton crop. Within a few weeks all sorts of motor cars were selling well, especially expensive cars. It was apparent that automobiles were no longer merely luxuries. There was even a promise of greater trade than ever, 
So rapidly were all the cars of war-warring nations being destroyed. But once Van Zyl had considered the possibility of letting go his Turricar interest in order to be safe, he seemed always to be considering it. Carl read fate in Van Zyl's abstract manner, and if Van Zyl withdrew, Carl's own stock would be worthless. But he stuck to his work with something of a boy's frightened stubbornness and something of a man's quiet sternness. Fear was never far from him. In an airplane he had never been greatly frightened. He could himself, by his own efforts, fight the wind. But how could he steer a world war or a world industry? He tried to conceal his anxiety from Ruth, but she guessed it. She said one evening, "'Sometimes I think we two are unusual because we really want to be free, and then a thing like this war comes in our bread and butter and little pink cakes are in danger, and I realize we're not free at all, and we're just like the rest, prisoners, dependent on how much the job brings and how fast the subway runs. Oh, sweetheart, we mustn't forget to be just mad, no matter how serious things become. Standing very close to him, she put her head on his shoulder. Sure mustn't. Must stick by each other all the more when the world takes a run and jumps on us. Indeed we will. Unsparingly, the war's cosmic idiocy continued, and Carl crawled along the edge of a business precipice, looking down. He became so accustomed to it that he began to enjoy the view. The old Carl, with the enthusiasm which had served him for that undefined quality called courage, began to come to life again, laughing. Let the darned old business bust if she's going to. Only it refused to bust. It kept on trembling while Carl became nervous again, then gaily defiant, then nervous again, till the alternation of groom and bravado disgusted him and made Ruth wonder whether he was an office slave or a freebooter, as he happened to be both at the time. It was hard for him to be either convincingly. She accused him of vacillating, he retorted, the suspense kept them both raw. To add to their difficulties of adjustment to each other, and to the ego-mad world, Ruth's sense of established amenities was shocked by the appearance of Carl's pioneering past as revealed in the lively but vulgar person of Martin Dockerill, Carl's former aviation mechanic. Martin Dockerill was lanky and awkward as ever. He still wrote postcards to his aunt in Fall River, and admired burlesque show choruses, but he no longer played the mouth-organ publicly, for he had become so well-to-do as to be respectable. As foreign agent for the Des Moines Auto Truck Company, he had toured Europe, selling war trucks, or lorries, as the English called them, first to the Balkan states, then to Italy, Russia, and Turkey. He was for a time detailed to the New York office. It did not occur either to him or to Carl that he was not welcome to drop in any time often as possible, to slap Carl on the back, loudly recollect the time when he had got drunk and fought with policemen from San Antonio, or to spend a whole evening belligerently discussing the idea of war or types of motor trucks when Ruth wistfully wanted Carl to herself. Martin supposed, because she smiled, that she was interested as Carl in his theories about airplane scouting and war. Ruth knew that most of Carl's life had been devoted to things quite outside her own sphere of action, but she had known it without feeling it. His talk with Martin showed her how sufficient his life had been without her. She began to worry lest he go back to aviation. So began their serious quarrels. There were not many of them, and they were forgotten out of existence in a day or two. But there were at least three pitched battles during which both of them believed that this ended everything. They quarreled always about the same thing which had intimidated them before. The need of quarreling through apropos of this every detail of life came up. Ruth's conformities, her fear that he would fly again, her fear that the wavering job was making him indecisive. And Martin Dockerell kept coming, as an excellent starting point for discussion. Ruth did not dislike Martin's roughness. But when the ex-mechanic discovered that he was making more money than was Carl, and asked Carl, in her presence, if he'd like a loan, then she hated Martin, and would give no reason. 
she became unable to see him as anything but a bore, an unpleasant service, whose friendship with Carl indicated that her husband, too, was an outsider. Believing that she was superbly holding herself in, she asked Carl if there was not some way of tactfully suggesting to Martin that he come to the flat only once in two weeks instead of two or three times a week. Carl was angry. She said furiously what she really thought, and retired to Aunt Emma's for the evening. When she returned, she expected to find Carl as repentant as herself. Unfortunately, that same Carl, who had declared that it was pure egotism to regard one's own religion or country as necessarily sacred, regarded his own friends as sacred, a noble faith which is an important cause of political graft. He was ramping about the living room, waiting for a fight. And he got it. The moment of indiscretion, the inevitable time when, believing themselves fearlessly frank, they exchanged every memory of an injury. Ruth pointed out that Carl had disliked Florence Cruden as much as she disliked Martin. She renewed her accusation that he was vacillating, scoffed at Walter McManus, whom she really liked, Gertie Cowles, whom she had never met, and even hesitantly, Carl's farmer relatives. And Carl was equally unpleasant. At her last thrust, he called her a thin-blooded New Yorker and slammed his bedroom door. They had broken their pledge not to go to bed on a quarrel. He was gone before she came out to breakfast in the morning. In the evening they were perilously polite again. Martin Dockerell appeared, and, while Ruth listened, Carl revealed how savagely his mind had turned overnight to a longing for such raw adventuring as she could never share. He feverishly confessed that he had for many weeks wavered between hating the whole war and wanting to enlist in the British Air Corps, to get life's supreme sensation, scouting ten thousand feet in the air, while dozens of batteries fired at him, a nose-to-earth volaplane. The thinking Carl, the playmate Carl that Ruth knew, was masked as the foolhardy adventurer and as one who not merely talking, but might really do the thing he pictured, and Martin Dockerell seemed so dreadfully to take it for granted that Carl might go. Carl's high note of madness dropped to a matter-of-fact chatter about a kind of wandering, which shut her out as completely as a project of war. "'I don't know,' said he, "'but what the biggest fun—' in chasing around the country is to get up from a pile of lumber where you've pounded your ear all night and get that funny railroad smell of greasy waste and then throw your feet for a hand out and sneak on a blind and go hiking off to some town you've never heard of with every brakey and constable out there after you that's living when martin was gone carl glanced at her she stiffened and pretended to be absorbed in a magazine. He took from the mess of papers and letters that lived in his inside coat pocket a war map he had clipped from a newspaper, and drew tactical lines on it. From his room he brought a small book he had bought that day. He studied it intently. Ruth managed to see that the title of the book was Airplane and Air Scouting in the European Armies. She sprang up and cried, Hawk, why are you reading that? Why shouldn't I read it? You don't mean to, you— Oh, no, I don't suppose I have the nerve to go and enlist now. You've already pointed that out to me. I've been getting cold feet. But why do you shut me out? Why do you? Oh, good Lord! Have we got to go all over this again? We've gone over it, and over it, and over it, till I'm sick of telling you it isn't true. I'm very sorry, Hawk. Thank you for making it clear to me that I'm a typical silly wife. And thank you for showing me I'm a clumsy brute. You've done it quite often now. Of course, it doesn't mean anything that I've given up aviation. Oh, don't be melodramatic. Or, if you must, don't fail to tell me that I've ruined your life. Very well. I won't say anything then, Ruth. Don't look at me like that, Hark. So hard studying me. Can't you understand? Haven't you any perception? Can't you understand how hard it is for me to come to you like this? After last night and try? 
very nice of you, he said grimly. With one cry of, oh, she ran into her bedroom. He could hear her sobbing. He could feel her agony dragging him to her. But no woman's arms could drag his anger this time to let it ache again. For once he definitely did not want to go to her, so futile to make up and quarrel, make up and quarrel. He was impatient about their distant sobs, expressed so clearly a wordless demand that he come to her and make peace. Hell! He croaked, jerked his top coat from its nail, and left the flat. Eleven o'clock of a chilly November evening. End of chapter 41、Chapter、Forty Two of Trail of the Hawk. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Vendetti, mikevendetti.com. Trail of the Hawk by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter Forty Two. Dizzy with all the problems of life, he did not notice where he went. He walked blocks, took a trolley car, got off to buy a strong cigar, took the next trolley that came along, was carried across the Fifty Ninth Street Bridge to Long Island. At the eighth or tenth stop, he hurried out of the car, just as it was starting again. He wondered why he had been such a fool as to leave it in the dark street, of flat-faced wooden houses with dooryards of trampled earth and general air of poverty, goats and lunch pails. He tramped on, a sullen and youthless man. Presently, he was in shaggy open country. He was frightened by his desertion of Ruth, but he did not want to go back nor even telephone to her. He had to diagram where and what and why he was, determine what he was to do. He disregarded the war as a cause of trouble. Had there been no extra business pressure caused by the war, there would have been some other focus for their misunderstandings. They would have quarreled over clothes and aviation, Aunt Emma and Martin Dockerell, poverty and dancing. Quite the same. Walking steadily with long periods, when he did not think, but stared at the dusty stars or the shaky, ill-lighted old houses, he aligned her every fault, unhappily rehearsed every quarrel in which he had been to blame. His lips moving, as he emphasized the righteous retorts he was almost certain he had made. It was not hard to find faults in her. Any two people who have spent more than two days together already have the material for a lifelong feud. In traits which at first were amusing or admirable, Ruth petty manners of which Carl had been proud, he now cited as snobbish affection. He did not spare his reverence, his passion, his fondness. He mutilated his soul like a hermit. He recalled her pleasure in giving him jolly surprises, in writing unexpected notes addressed to him at the office as fussy discontent over normal life. He regarded her excitement over dances as evidence that she was so dependent on country club society that he would have to spend the rest of his life drudging for her. He wanted to flee. He saw the whole world as a conspiracy of secret, sinister powers. That are concealed from the child, but to the man are gradually revealed by a pitiless, and never-ending succession of misfortunes. He would never be footloose again. His land of heart's desire would be the office. But the ache of disappointment grew dull. He was stunned. He did not know what had happened. Did not even know precisely how he came to be walking here. Now and then he remembered and knew. That he had sharply left Ruth, Ruth, his dear girl, remembered that she was not at hand, ready to explain with love's lips the somber puzzles of life. He was frightened again, and beginning to be angry with himself for having been angry with Ruth. He had walked many miles. Brown fields came up at him through the paling darkness. A signboard showed that he was a few miles from Mineola. Letting the coming dawn uplift him. He tramped into Mineola with a half plan of going on to the nearby Hempstead Plains Aviation Field to see if there was any early morning flying. It would be bully to see a machine again. At a lunch wagon, he ordered buckwheat cakes and coffee. 
sitting on a high stool before a seven-inch shelf attached to the wall, facing an array of salt casters and ketchup bottles, and one of those colored glass windows with a portrait of Washington, which give to all lunch wagons their air of sober refinement. Carl ate solemnly, meditatively. It did not seem to him an a noble setting for his grief, but he was depressed when he came out to a drab first light of day that made the street seem hopeless and unrested after the night. The shops were becoming visible, gray and chilly, like a just-awakened janitor in slippers, suspenders, and tousled hair. The pavement was wet. Carl crossed the street, stared at the fly-speckled cover of a magazine six months old that lay in a shop window, lighted by one incandescent. He gloomily planned to go back and have another cup of coffee on the shelf before Washington's glossy but benign face. But he looked down the street, and all the sky was becoming a delicate and luminous blue. He trotted off toward Hempstead Plains. The aviation field was almost abandoned. Most of the ambitious line of hangars were empty now, with faded grass thick before the great doors that no one ever opened. A recent fire had destroyed a group of five hangars. He found one door open, and three sleepy youngsters in sweaters and khaki trousers bringing out a monoplane. Carl watched them start, bobbed his chin to the music of the motor, saw the machine canter down the field and ascend from the dawn to the glory of day. The rising sun picked out the lines of the uniclose framework and hovered on the silvery wing surface. The machine circled the field at two hundred feet elevation, smoothly, peacefully, and peace beyond understanding came to Carl. He studied the flight. Hmm, good and steady. Banks a little sharp, but very thorough. First rate. I believe I could get more speed out of her if I were flying. Like to try. Wonderingly, he realized that he did not want to fly, that only his lips said, like to try. He was almost as much an outsider to aviation as though he had never flown. He discovered that he was telling Ruth this fact in an imaginary conversation, was commenting for her on dawn sky and the plains before him, and his alienation from exploits in which she could not share. The monoplane landed with a clean volplane. The aviator and his mechanics were wheeling it toward the hangar. They glanced at him uninterestedly. Carl understood that. To them, he was a typical bystander, here where he once starred. The aviator stared again, let go of the machine, walked over, exclaiming, "'Say, aren't you Hawk Erickson? This is an honor. I heard you were somewhere in New York. Just missed you at the Aero Club one night. Wanted to ask you about the Bagby Hydro. Won't you come in and have some coffee and sinkers with us? Proud to have you. My name's Barry.' Thanks. Be glad to. While the youngsters were admiring him, hearing of the giants of earlier days, while they were drinking inspiration from this veteran of twenty-nine, they were in turn inspiring Carl by their faith in him. He had been humble. They made him trust himself, not egotistically, but with a feeling that he did matter, that it was worth while to be in tune with life. Yet all the while he knew that he wanted to be by himself, because he could thus be with the spirit of Ruth, and he knew subconsciously that he was going to hurry back to Mineola and telephone her. As he dog-trotted down the road, he noted the old Dutch houses for her, picked out the spot where he had once had a canvas hangar, and fancied himself telling her of those days. He did not remember that this hangar he had known Istra, Istra Nash, the artist whose name he scarce recalled. Istra was an incident. Ruth was the meaning of his life and the solution of his problems came all at once, when suddenly it was given to him to understand what that problem was. Ruth and he had to be up and away, immediately, go any place, do anything, so long as they followed new trails and followed them together. He knew positively, after his lonely night, that he could not be happy without her as comrade in the freedom he craved, and he also knew that they had not done the one thing for which their marriage existed. They were not just a man and a woman. They were a man and a woman who had promised to find new horizons for each other. 
however much he believed in the sanctity of love's children. Carl also believed that merely to be married and breed casual children and die is a sort of suspended energy, which has no conceivable place in this overall complex and unwieldy world. He had no clear nor ringing message, but he did have, just then, an overpowering conviction that Ruth and he, not every one, but Ruth and he, at least, had a vocation in keeping clear of vocations, and that they must fulfill it. Over the telephone he said, Ruth, dear, I'll be right there. Walked all night. Got straightened out now. I'm in Mineola. It's all right with me now. Blessed, I want frightfully much to make it all right with you. I'll be there in about an hour. She answered yes, so noncommittedly that he was smitten by the fact that he had yet to win forgiveness for his frenzy in leaving her, that he must break the shell of resentment which would increase her after a whole night's brooding between sullen walls. On the train, unconscious of its uproar, he was bespelled by his new love. During a few moments of their lives, ordinary real people, people real as a toothbrush, do actually transcend the coarsely physical aspects of sex and feeding, and do approximate to the unwavering glow of romantic heroes. Carl was no more a romantic hero lover than as a celebrated aviator. He had been a hero adventurer. He was a human being. He was not even admirable, except as all people are admirable, from the ashman to the king. There had been nothing exemplary in his struggle to find adjustment with his wife. He had been bad in his impatience, just as he had been good in his boyish affection. In both, he had been human. Even now, when without reserve he gave himself up to love, he was aware that he would ascend, not on godlike pinions, but by a jerky old apartment-house elevator, to make peace with a vexed girl, who was also a human being, with a digestive system and prejudices, yet with a joy that encompassed all the beauty of banners and saluting swords, romantic towers, and a fugitive queen, a joy transcending trains and elevators and prejudices. Carl knew that human girl as the symbol of man's yearning for union with the divine. He desired happiness for her with a devotion great as the passion in Galadad's heart when all night he knelt before the high altar. He came slowly up to their apartment house, if it were only possible for Ruth to trust him now. Mingled with his painfully clear remembrance of all the sweet things Ruth was and had done, was the tragic astonishment that he, the same he who was all hers now, could possibly have turned impatiently from her sobs. Yet it would have been for good, if only she would trust him. Not till he left the elevator on their floor did he comprehend that Ruth might not be awaiting him, might have gone. He looked irresolutely at the grill of the elevator, shut on the black shaft. She was here when I telephoned. He waited. Perhaps she would peep out to see if it was he who had come up in the elevator. She did not dare appear. He walked the endless distance of ten feet to the door, unlocked it, labored across the tiny hall into the living room. She was there. She stood supporting herself by the back of the Davenport, her eyes red-edged and doubtful, her face tightened, expressing an enemy or dread or shy longing. He held out his hands like a prisoner, beseeching royal mercy. She, in turn, threw out her arms. He could not say one word. The clumsy sign called words could not tell his emotion. He ran to her, and she welcomed his arms. He held her, abandoned himself utterly to her kiss. His hard, driving mind relaxed. Relaxed was her body in his arms. He knew, not merely with his mind, but with the vaster powers that drive mind and emotion and body, that Ruth, in her disheveled dressing-gown, was the glorious lover to whom he had been hastening this past hour. All the love which civilization had tried to turn into normal married life had escaped efficiency's pruning hook, and had flowered. "'It's all right with me now,' she said. "'So wonderful. All right.' "'I want to explain.' had to be by myself, find out. 
must have seemed so unspeakably. Oh, don't, don't explain. Our kiss explained. While they talked on the Davenport together, reaching out again and again for the hands that now really were there, Ruth agreed with Carl that they must be up and away, not wait till it should be too late. She too saw how many lovers plan under the June honeymoon to sail away after a year or two and see the great world and, when they weary die, know that it will still be a year or two before they can flee to the Halcyon Isles. But she did insist that they plan practically, and it was she who wondered, but what would happen if everyone went skipping off like us? Who'd bear the children and keep the fields plowed to feed the ones that ran away? Golly, cried Carl, wish that were the worst problem we had. Maybe a thousand years from now, when everyone is so artistic that they want to write books, it will be hard to get enough drudges. But now, look at any office with the clerks tolling away day after day, even the unmarried ones. Look at all the young fathers of families giving up everything they want to do to support children who'll do the same thing right over again with their children, always handing on the torch of life, but never getting any light from it. People don't run away from slavery often enough, and so they don't ever get to do real work either. But, sweetheart, what if we should have children some day? You know, of course we haven't been ready for them yet, but some day they might come anyhow, and how could we wander round? Oh, probably they will come some day, and then we'll take our dose of drudgery like the rest. There's nothing in our dear civilization punishes as it does begetting children. For poisoning food by adulterating it, you may get fined fifty dollars. But if you have children, they call it a miracle as it is. And then they get busy and condemn you to a lifetime of being scared by the boss. Well, darling, please don't blame it on me. I didn't mean to get so oratorical, blessed. But it does make me mad the way the state punishes one for being willing to work and have children. Perhaps if enough of us run away from nice normal grinding, we'll start people wondering just why they should go on toiling to produce a lot of booze and clothes and things that nobody needs. Perhaps, my hawk, don't you think, though, that we might be bored in our Rocky Mountain cabin if we were there for months and months? Yes, I suppose so, Carl mused. The rebellion against stuffy marriage has to be a whole lot wider than some little detail like changing from city to country. Probably for some people the happiest thing would be to live in a whole bohemian flat and have parties, and for some to live in the suburbs and get the missus elected president of the Village Improvement Society. For us, I believe it's change and keep going. Yes, I think so, Hawk, my Hawk. I lay awake nearly all night last night, realizing that we are one, not because of a wedding ceremony, but because we can understand each other's make-believes and seriousness. I knew that no matter what happened, we had to try again. I saw last night by myself that it was not a question of finding out whose fault a quarrel was, that it wasn't anybody's fault, but just conditions, and we'll change them. We won't be afraid to be free. We won't, Lord. Life's wonderful. Yes, when I think of how sweet life can be, so wonderfully sweet, I know that all the prophets must love human beings, oh, so terribly, no matter how sad they are about the petty things that lives are wasted over. But I'm not a prophet. I'm a girl that's awfully much in love. And darling, I want you to hold me close. Three months later, in February 1915, Ruth and Carl sailed for Buenos Aires, America's new export market. Carl was the Argentine Republic manager for the Van Zyl Motor Corporation, possessed of an important salary, a possibility of large commissions, all hopes like comets. Their happiness seemed a thing enchanted. They had not quarreled again. The S.S. Sangriel for Buenos Aires and Rio had sailed from snow into summer. Ruth and Carl watched aisles of palms turn to fantasies carved of ebony in rose and garnet sunset waters, and the vast sky laugh out in stars. Carl was quoting Kipling. 
The Lord knows what we may find, dear lass, and the deuce knows what we may do. But we're back once more on the old trail, our own trail, the out trail. We're down hull, down on the old trail, the trail that is always new. Anyway, he commented, deuce only knows what we'll do after Argentine, and I don't care, do you? Her clasping hand answered as he went on. Oh, say, blessed, I forgot to look in the directory before we left New York to see if there wasn't a society for the spread of madness among the respectable. It might have sent us out as missionaries. There's a flying fish, and tomorrow I won't have to watch clerks punch a time clock, and you can hear a sailor shifting the ventilators, and there's a little star perched on the foremast, singing. But the big thing is that you're here beside me, and we're going. How bully it is to be living, if you don't have to give up living in order to make a living. The End End of Chapter 42 Recording by Mike Vendetti, Canyon City, Colorado, MikeVendetti.com End of Trail of the Hawk by Sinclair Lewis